so good to be in God's house today. Y'all are a good looking group and you're festive and in the right mood for worship today. Thank you for being here. And as you can see, we will be in the book of 2 Samuel in the ninth chapter in your Old Testament. We are in the midst of a sermon series about gratitude and having a grateful attitude and being a thankful people and how having gratitude is very transforming in your life. That grateful people and thankful people tend to have a uh, better disposition in life for one thing. And nobody likes to be around someone who's negative and constantly only sees the bad in, in situations. We, we Christians have so much to be thankful for that to me Thanksgiving ought to mean way more to you if you're a believer uh, than just the, just the person who's out there and doesn't know Christ. So we've looked at some individuals in the scripture. We've looked at some who were not so thankful and some who were thankful. You may recall we, we studied about ten lepers who were cleansed of their skin disease by the Lord Jesus. And nine of them were so excited they just took off back to their lives, back to the city. And only one of them returned and was thankful toward Jesus. And Jesus told him that his, his faith had had saved him. That the, these other men were cleansed, but this man who was thankful, he was made whole. He was saved by the Lord Jesus. Last week, you may recall, we looked at a, a woman that we were, were told was a, leading a, a very deep life of sin before Jesus found her. And she came to where Jesus was and knelt down at his feet and, and just with her tears was, was crying and, and just worshiping him there and, and had a bottle of really expensive ointment and poured it out on the feet of Jesus. And there were those there who didn't understand why Jesus would allow some old sinner to, to touch him. And, and he told her too, he said, your faith, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you well. So we, we've seen twice now in Scripture that having thankfulness toward the Lord Jesus, first of all, is going gonna, is gonna to produce joy in your life. You know, to be a grateful person and, and to be thankful for what God's doing in your life will bring joy. And we saw last week that it'll bring worship. Extravagant worship. I mean, this woman didn't care what anyone thought of her or how much it cost her to pour that out. She said, I'm giving everything to Jesus because he saved my soul. I feel that, don't you? Do you have that much gratitude this morning toward the Lord that you're so glad to be saved that you say, I, I just want to worship the Lord. That, that's where your singing comes from in church is, is not from your, from your mouth, but from way deep down in the heart. You bring out that worship and you say, that's what I'm going to pour out at the feet of Jesus today. So being thankful and being grateful will, will transform you in many different ways. And we're going to look at another way it'll do that this morning in a story about a man named Mephibosheth. <laughs> I'm going to try not to say that too much because I know I'm going to mess it up. Y'all just have grace on me, okay? If I can't pronounce this guy right, Mephibosheth. It's not easy to say. And it's a bit of an unusual story that I somehow or another, I, I missed this one for years. It's right in the middle of the story of David, and we know David had some amazing exploits in, in battle and some amazing failures too and amazing forgiveness from God, but... I think a lot of the story of David's life overshadows this story. And so I, I, I really hadn't paid it much attention in, in, in years until the Lord brought it to me and I said, wow, there is really a, a lot in this. Now, now, to set the stage here, I want you to recall 
if, if you've studied the Bible much, that the first king back then was, was Saul. And he kind of went, went mad. And he hated David because David was the, the boy that God wanted to be king there in Israel. And, and so Saul wanted him dead. He was angry with him and, and just his arch enemy. Saul pursued David across the land. David had to live like Robin Hood, kind of. You know, I mean, he lived out in the wilderness in caves and hid out and with, this, with this king pursuing him and, and wanting him dead. And David had a deep friendship. I, I mean, a real best friend situation with the son of Saul, whose name was Jonathan. He and David were best friends and did each other a lot of kindness over the years. The only problem was, of course, the, the king wanted David dead. And eventually, both Saul and Jonathan, his son, David's best friend, were killed in battle. They were killed in battle at, at the, same, the same battle. They both fell. David became king. And he mourned that his good friend Jonathan had, had died as well. In fact, David mourned the whole situation. You know, he, he didn't see Saul as his, his, this horrific, bloodthirsty enemy that he wanted revenge on. You know, he, he found it like we do to be a tragedy that, that people could get that crossways with each other. But the, the King Saul and, and his son Jonathan, who was the best friend of, of David, they both died in battle. David became king. And I want you to see what David did next. Very, very interesting stuff that will show you a little something about gratitude in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to begin to read there in verse 1. It says, Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? You know, David's remembering his good friend here. And he says, Jonathan was so good to me. Saul was terrible to me, but I, I love Jonathan. And I, I'd just like to do some kindness for that household. If there's anybody who remains of them, I'll, I'll do good to them. And verse 2 says, There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. This man was disabled somehow. We're not told why, but apparently his, his feet had some, some real difficulty. He was lame in his feet, it says, and in verse 4, so the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. And then David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David. So this, this man who's lame in his feet, he's called to the king's court. And what he did there, it says he fell on his face. He prostrated himself. He, he laid out on the floor. And, 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 David answered, and David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant? that you should look upon such a dead dog as I. And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him. You shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded to his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, and he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. What a beautiful act of kindness, amen? amen? That's a wonderful story, it really is. Let's have a word of prayer before we go any further, and we'll ask the Lord to help us see what's in this for us today. Would you join me? 
Father, today it is such a privilege to be in Your holy house. We're here, Father, to receive from You. We're here to receive Your Word. As we look into the Scriptures, Father, we know this isn't just an ancient story. We know there's something in it for us today. So we want our hearts to be in tune with You today, Father. We want to yield ourselves and open ourselves to You and say, Lord, be my teacher today. Show me if there's a wicked way in me. Point me into the way everlasting. We love You, Lord, because You first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. Boy, it's an interesting story to me because there's a lot going on here that doesn't make sense in the natural, to the natural mind. You know, this Mephibosheth apparently was, you know, fairly unknown, one of the, the outcasts of society. He had some kind of disability in his feet that we don't understand today, but maybe he, he may have even had a great difficulty walking. That's probably what was going on there, and he was sort of forgotten. And David decided that on Jonathan's, you know, in commemoration of his friendship and, and the brotherly love that he'd shown him over the years, he wanted to do good for somebody who had been of, of Jonathan's household, and that just happened to be this Mephibosheth. And I'm doing pretty good on pronouncing it so far, amen? A little credit? I'm trying. So he, he's looking for somebody to do kindness for. And, and I want you, you Christians who have who have been believers a while, I want you to catch this real, real quick here. Catch this immediately. You may recall that last week we looked at the scripture there where it says, he who has been forgiven much, loves much. But he who has been forgiven little, will love little, right? Well, you and I, we have been forgiven so much by God. We have received kindness from Him. And if you are a mature Christian, and I think many of us here would say, yeah, I've, I've been around for a while, Pastor. I, I, know, I know a few things about the Lord. Gratefulness. Gratitude for what God has done for you will produce worship. It will produce joy. We've already seen those too. But what it also will produce in you is service. It, being a grateful person, having the right attitude of gratefulness toward God, makes you want to serve God. Amen? Not because you're obligated and, and you're trying to repay God for your salvation, but because out of the heart of gratitude, you want to do what David did right here. He said, who can I do kindness to? That ought to be every Christian in the world's attitude. Lord, show me somebody that I can do something good for. I'm looking for, I'm scanning out here for somebody I can bless. Somebody I can do a kindness to. And, and you know, you, all of your helpers who stood up a while ago, right? They, they sacrifice their Saturday evening. They sacrifice family time. Sacrifice some money even to be here. And they, they probably didn't want recognized and called because they're servants, right? They just said, who can I do a kindness to? Who can, who can I show the kindness of God to? And so that's what gratitude will produce in you. And I would dare say, if you're not doing anything for God, if you're not serving the Lord, it's because you have a gratitude problem. You have not yet considered. See, he who has been forgiven much loves much. And out of a heart of love, if you, if you know how much you've been forgiven for and you're thankful for it, you'll be just like David here. You'll say, there's got to be somebody out here I can do a kindness for. And so, you, you know, you hear about somebody who's got an extra turkey and you, you start looking for somebody who could use that thing, right? You, there's a million ways to be a blessing to somebody. But as Christians, we've got to get our eyes off ourselves and stop saying, poor little old me and boy, what do I want? What are my interests? And instead turn around and say, who could I do a kindness for? Who needs me? Surely, surely there's somebody that I can offer the kindness of the Lord to. And that word kindness, it's beautiful. That, that word kindness in the Hebrew it is the same word that is used for a, a, a mother who pulls a child close. Boy, isn't that what God has done to us? All of us rebellious old sinners, He grabs us up and pulls us in in a, in a tight embrace. He says, I love you. I saved your soul because I love you. He, he's done us a kindness 
which literally means we're in the arms of God. That feels pretty good this morning, don't it? Amen. Yeah. So then what do we want to do? We want to turn around and show almost a mothering kind of love. A sacrificial sort of love. A love that serves. We want to turn around and show that to somebody else so that maybe they can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. See, there's nothing selfish or mechanical in it at all, is there? It's all out of the heart that overflows with gratitude for, from the love that we had received. David said, Jonathan loved me. He was my best friend. And he died in battle. Is there anybody in his... Now that I'm king... Boy, David could have easily went the other way, couldn't he? He said, I'm king now and things are going to be different around here. There's a new sheriff in town and I'm going to get this thing I've always wanted and that thing I've always wanted and this palace is going to be built and I'm going to have this and that and this and that and boy, I'm rich and isn't it great? That's the way of the world. Instead, once he had reached a position where he could help somebody, he said, well, I'm not living in a cave anymore. Who can I show kindness to? Not revenge, which a lot of us would have said, I'm going to go get all those people who, who have harassed me and have been at war with me for so long. In fact, wouldn't it have made more sense? Think about it. In the ancient world, wouldn't it have made more sense for David to have Mephibosheth killed? After all, he Saul's grandson. What if someday he decides, I want to be king, and he gets a following, and he comes after me? I'll just take them out. I'll just kill that bloodline and then I'll never have to worry about those people again. That's what a lot of rulers would have did back then. Don't just wipe out the, the ruler. Wipe out his family so they never have a claim to the throne. Instead, David says, who's out there I can be kind to? And come to find out there was somebody who needed a little kindness. A man who was, who was lame in his feet and, and was forgotten and, and didn't have, you know probably didn't have much going for himself. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him Saul's land. I'm going to give him Jonathan and Saul's servants. And he orders them now, you will be servants of Mephibosheth. And then he does the unthinkable. Mephibosheth is going to eat at my table from now on. Now you think about that kingly table. You've seen in movies, right, where a king has a table and it's 80 miles long, <laughs> you know? There's people coming in and you're hosting people and having banquets and having feasts and the important people of the land come in and talking politics and, and you, know, you know how it goes. Don't you know some of them might have looked down to the end of that table and saw Mephibosheth down there and said, who's that guy? Who's that? What's he doing in here? Have, have we just grabbed some beggar and brought him in? That must have been an odd sight. But everybody from that day forward who ate at David's table as a king saw Mephibosheth sitting there with his broken or disabled legs eating at the king's table. That's quite a story, isn't it? We Christians need to be looking for folks that we can be a blessing and do a kindness to now, the wonderful thing about this whole story is the same wonderful thing about these other two stories I told you. The ten lepers, the sinful woman, Mephibosheth, all have something in common. And that is that they very well represent all of us before we come to Jesus. I'm the leper. We all are. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm the sinful woman. We all have messed up and made those sorts of mistakes. I'm Mephibosheth. I, I'm the one who before God, God got a hold of me, I, I, I couldn't walk, right? And had nothing, had no place. Pro probably deserved death, Right? We're told that our sin separates us from God. And so all of these people who came for, for cleansing and, and came to worship and came to love and came for forgiveness, they represent humanity. You and I are the lepers. You and I are the sinful. 
You and I are the harassed and hated and hurt. You and I are the ones who have been through the fire that the world throws you into again and again. That is us. And yes, we are Mephibosheth. Cut off from the king's line and deserving of nothing. But instead, what has our king done? Our king looked at us and said, I want to show them kindness. I want to gather them up like a mother gathers her child. I want to show them ultimate kindness. And what does he do? He becomes a man and dies for us. There could be no greater. No greater expression of love that has already been shown for me and you. That when we were the beggars at the foot of God's door, that He said, I want to be kind to them. They've got nothing to offer. They've got no leg to stand on. They have no lineage. They have no connection. They're outcasts. But I love them so much that my Son will die for them. Did He not show us the greatest kindness that has ever been shown, church? And if you can't be thankful for that, your, your, your pilot's out. You're going to have to get fired back up somehow because you're missing the point. And the point is, God who has loved us this much ought to produce that much love in us. And we ought to love somebody else like that. Hallelujah. What's going to win people to Jesus? The preacher's fancy words? No. What's going to win people to Jesus? Handing them a gospel tract? No. What's going to win them to Jesus is when they experience the love of Jesus. And we've got to be a church that exudes that love. We're dripping in it. We're willing to show it to everybody. We look out here in the world and we say, well, yeah, I, I'm able to see what everybody else is able to see. That humanity is all messed up. But I want to show them kindness by bringing them to the king's table. <laughs> Woo, I'm telling you what, church. One thing I'm looking forward to, I'm excited about Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm excited about Thanksgiving, but what I'm really excited about is the Scripture tells us that when we all get to heaven, there's going to be a wedding supper of the Lamb. With heavenly food. Hey, I don't, I don't know. That'd be venison and morel mushrooms if it was up to me, but I don't know. There's, <laughs> there's got to be something better in heaven, right? And God's going to feed every one of us. And when you get there, you won't have to be worried whether there's a place there for you or not. Because if Mephibosheth can make it, I can too. Why? Because I'm so good? No, because the king has done me a kindness. The king has brought me to his table. And he said, Mephibosheth, you can eat at the king's table for the rest of your days. And it's a wonderful truth to know that that doesn't just mean, in our case, to the end of your natural life, because my days aren't going to end at the end of my natural life. My days are going to go on forever because Jesus has saved my soul. I've got a spot at the king's table. Who am I? Who are any of us, right? We're Mephibosheth. We're, we're the beggar. We're the crippled. We're the, we're the blind. We're, 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 all of the, we're the leper. We're, we're these outcasts. We're all these people in the Scripture. And God says, come. Come to the table. There is a spot for you. And it doesn't matter who else may be at the table and sneer at him and say, well, what's he doing here? I bet there was a lot of that. But I bet old David took up for Mephibosheth a few times, right? I bet he'd take up for him and say, this man belongs here because I said he could be here and I'm the king. We have so much to be thankful for. I know I keep saying that. But if you, but if you can't find gratitude in your heart, if you can't overcome a nasty attitude in order to be thankful toward the Lord, you got to reevaluate your priorities. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Because we've all been forgiven much. It ought to produce a love, an overwhelming, overflowing love in us that says, you know what, who can I, 
Verse 3, the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? He said, I don't want to just show him human kindness. I want to show him the kindness of God. Now Mephibosheth's response is a lot like many of ours. You know, I, I bet he figured David was going to kill him that day when he summoned him. And he fell down before him. And David said, you're going to live. It's going to be okay. And what was Mephibosheth's response? He said, I'm a dead dog compared to you, O king. It's good to know your place before God, isn't it? Just about the time you're thinking you're somebody, we need to get that kind of humility that says, you know what? Before the Lord Jesus, I'm a dead dog. But praise God, he loved this old dead dog enough to bring me back to life. We're seeing that happen in people here at the church. Why? Because God is eager to save. That's the good news, sister, is that God isn't out here distant, you know, playing games and, and you gotta, you gotta, boy, you got to try real hard to get it. No, it's like he's on the boat just reaching out. He's eager to save anybody who will come, whosoever will, and whosoever surely means me. Be thankful, church. God bless you. Let's close with a song. Thank you for your kind attention. I praise God for you, church. Have thine own way, 544. If you turn there, we're going to have a little time here to allow us all to respond to what we've, what we've heard and experienced today. So as you find that hymn, just hold on to that place and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, we are so grateful that there was a spot here at your table today for us. We're thankful, Father, that though we have nothing to offer and might as well be a dead dog, that you take us in, that you love us like a mother to child. You just pull us close and just want fellowship with us. Father, I'm sorry and I repent of all times when I've not been thankful for your blessings on me. I pray, Father, that you would, have, you would help us to have love and gratitude just erupt from us so that we might want to do a kindness for someone else. It's a great season of serving, we know, Father, and I pray that you will use us to reach somebody here at Thanksgiving and Christmas time. Lord, I want to pray especially if there's anybody in the house today who's never made Jesus the Lord of their life. They're searching for the Prince of Peace, and I know, Lord, that you are here and ready to save. If there's anybody here in the sound of my voice who says, Pastor, that's me, I need to be forgiven. I, I'm Mephibosheth and I'm, I'm coming to the table. Well, friend, in just a few moments, we're going to begin to sing our final hymn. And as we do, I'm going to ask you to be bold and to come forward. I'd like to pray with you right here and I'll introduce you to that King of Kings. You can leave here today knowing that if something happened to you, that when you die, you're going straight to the kingdom of God. And the way that you know that is you need to have your sins forgiven and only Jesus can do it. He invites us in. He's provided a door. It's His own Son. And He says, Come to Me, all of you who are hungry, all of you who thirst for righteousness. You shall be filled. You shall be filled at the King's table. Holy Spirit, have Your own way indeed in this house today. May we not do a thing that would grieve or quench Your holy work. Touch every heart, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. 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 Let's stand together and sing our final hymn. And as we do, the altar is open if you want to be saved today. Come find me in Jesus' name.
Please be seated for a few moments.